Welcome. I'm delighted to see you this evening, joined by two of my treasured colleagues, Dr. Tal Ben-Shahar and Dr. Dr. Keltner. We'll be sharing with you our perspectives on spirituality, happiness, and ways to understand and move through this current period. We're each going to speak for about five minutes, and then we're going to engage in conversation. So as we near Thanksgiving, we wish the very best to you and your families, and may this be a time of renewal and joy. To start, uh, my name is Dr. Lisa Miller. I'm a professor of 20 years at Columbia University. I'm sharing with you some of the findings we have on spirituality and renewal, and in particular, the impact on spirituality in moving through very, very difficult times, such as the time we've just faced with COVID and the trail end that to many people seems interminable. To share with you perhaps the four major findings of science, I'll nest what could be perhaps a bit dry in a story. And as a psychologist, I figure there's nowhere better than to start at home. So I'll share with you a story of trauma in my own life. Um, a few years ago, my husband and I were very, very hungry to start a family. Um, we had the things we thought we wanted. We had the jobs we wanted. We had the marriage we wanted. We had the home we wanted, but the kids just didn't seem to be coming. And in this experience of trying and trying and trying to conceive children, over the first six months, it was dis disappointing. Over the first 18 months, it got a little depressing. But when we moved on to three and four years of not conceiving children, it became devastating. And one night I looked over and I didn't see my husband in the bed. He was lying on the floor. He was so depressed. And he said, our lives, are hollow and meaningless without children. There was nothing we could do. We went to every top infertility doctor who we could find. We went to the people who invented in vitro using sea urchins. We went to Philadelphia and Boston and the West Coast. And all the while that we went through this downward spiral of despair, growing more and more depressed, I started to notice that right when I thought there was absolutely no hope, somebody would show up and they'd say the most unbelievable things. So for instance, after the third in failed in vitro, I was riding the bus down the street, hopped on this gentleman and he was a little unusual and I kept thinking, I hope he doesn't sit near me. And sure enough, this unusual gentleman came over and he sat right near me. And then he said, you know, you, you look actually very nice, which I was relieved to hear because I'd hope he hadn't, wouldn't sit near me. He said, you actually look just like that type of woman that would go all over the world adopting children. And I thought, well, that's something I'd never thought of. But I persisted. I heard it, but I persisted. And so did my husband. We wanted a kid who looked like us, who we thought was so interesting and funny like us. We wanted our child. And so onward we went, head first, I might even say ego first in retrospect, looking for our child to be conceived. Fast forward, we're now on the fifth failed in vitro, lying in a very nice hotel in Philadelphia and in solidarity, my husband by my side, when we found that the remote wouldn't change the channel on the TV, this overpriced TV. What channel of all channels were we watching? It was an interminable documentary on a street child. A street child standing in a garbage dump in South America, and through the translator, the child says, I don't care that I live here in the garbage dump. I don't care that I can't go to school, but it hurts so much to not be loved that I sniff glue to make the pain go away. Now that one hit me a little harder than the guy on the bus, because there I was full of pins and needles, full of medicines, lying in this overpriced hotel after a very expensive procedure. And this little fellow was saying all he had wanted was a mother. And that all that would have taken was love and commitment. So he'd been miserable for at least five years and I'd been miserable now for five years. And I realized that the only thing coming between my husband and I and our beautiful family was that we had yet to wake up to the deeper nature of life and the deeper nature of parenthood. And gradually, gradually, as if little by little, our egos were being chipped away, we got the picture 
that actually parenting is not the kid who has the same nose or the same humor or the same facial features. Parenting is deep love and deep commitment. And then as we went down this path of meaningful alignments, I might call them synchronicities, I became even more deeply aware beyond the specificity of parenting that the nature of life was not one in which the most important moments, the things that are most significant to our journey on earth were controlled or concocted, that we could have A plus B plus C all lined up, but that didn't mean D was coming, but rather the deeper nature of life was a dialogue. The deeper nature of life was a two-way street between an open heart and the revelation of what is life showing me now? Whether the guy on the bus or the child in the garbage dump, what was life showing me now? Life was showing me that we weren't going to make a child and no one does. That a child is a gift of God. The child is a gift of the universe. The child comes as a soul on earth and who comes through all space and time is no more yours or no more not yours if conceived in your body in a test tube or if adopted or found through marriage, a child is your child because they are your spiritual child. This view of synchronicity opening my eyes, awakening me to the deeper nature of life, not as one to be controlled, but in a deep dialogue in living with spirit, spirit in and through life, in and through every one of us, led me to pursue in the lab a line of science that looked at the part of our brain, what I've come to call the awakened brain, that is a receptive form of perception. The form of perception that when we ask, what is life showing me now? Like a ball in a catcher's mat receives the answer. And it may take time. This is a high pixel form of information that comes. It could take months or years to unfurl the fullness of that catch. But through the years of inquiry, through MRIs, through functional MRIs, through DTI, through many levels of analysis and science, we have come to see that every one of us is endowed with the capacity for transcendent awareness. And every one of us, by way of analogy, can strengthen this muscle. And if we do strengthen our awakened awareness, we are indeed less depressed. We are less drawn into addiction. We are far less at risk for suicide because life no longer is understood by I got what I want or I didn't. I no longer say I feel gypped or I'm such a loser, but rather when I'm in deep awareness of this dialogue, the transcendent dialogue of spirit in and through life, life is full. Life is abundant. Life is loving, holding and guiding. And we are never alone. We're absolutely never alone. Awakened awareness is all of ours. And when we realize our birthright, we become whole. Right now in the tri-state area, in California, all over the world, we're coming out of a collective trauma. We have an opportunity to ask yes in our own homes, but more greatly and more significantly together. What is life showing us now? And what does my deep inner wisdom say about that? So that we will not simply be resilient or back to baseline, but that we're on the cusp of a 52 card pickup that yields a whole new rearrangement of meaning. We can live together in a more loving, guiding way, never leaving anyone alone. We can have a more awakened society. I'm gonna ask if my colleagues now might share a few words. Dr. Docker Keltner, professor at UC Berkeley. Thank you for joining us. You're up. Uh, thank you, Lisa. So, um, you know, thinking about the topic of our time together with two of my real favorite scholars in the science of happiness and, and meaning um, uh, and the topics of community and spirit, um, I think it's really important that we talk about um, something that William James was interested in for quite some time. Uh, it's been a fascinating emotion really is the emotion of spirit and community, which is something we've been studying in my lab for about 15 years, which is awe. Um, uh, just to give you sort of some of the scientific facts uh, or findings, um, awe is when you are around vast mysteries, right? It could be a weather system or a supernatural event or somebody who astounds you with their kindness or courage. 
Um, remarkably, what we find, and this is one of the really striking findings in our work is, you know, we tend to think of awe as rare and um, something that only happens once or twice in a lifetime, but people are feeling awe two to three times a week. Uh, and as Lisa said, it's around us. Um, I'll talk about the realms in which we find awe, but let me just briefly talk about a couple of its benefits or effects. Uh, really good for your nervous system. It quiets down the inflammation response, which is problematic for health, gives you a, a, a greater sense of time. It reduces stress on a daily basis. Um, it produces these epiphanies the, that really are probably served by what Lisa talked about, the awakened brain or sort of a sense of transcendence. And the way that we've been thinking about them is that, in, and it echoes Lisa's language, which is when you feel awe out in nature, or around a morally inspiring person or a piece of music or contemplation, it opens your mind to what I call the systems of life, right? And you see their systems to stars or to tide pools to human societies or dance movements. Um, so it's just this remarkable emotion. I think when you put it all together, it's really hard to imagine, you know, we're coming out of COVID trying to find our rhythms again, and there's almost nothing you could do that won't get us back to a sense of community and spirit than awe. And it's right there for us to practice. So let me um, tell you how I've practiced it. Um, and like Lisa, uh, it, I re it really became poignant in coming out of trauma. Um, two and a half years ago, uh, after a two year struggle with colon cancer, my younger brother passed away. Um, for those of you who have watched colon cancer, it's horrific. Uh, he was my companion in awe through life. Uh, we were one year uh, apart, did everything together. Uh, and I have to say, like some people feel coming out of the trauma of COVID or you've lost a, a, a family member, the word that described how I felt was aweless. I, um, I, nothing had meaning. Um, you know, I was in a state of, you know, the things that I usually found deep meaning in you know, family members and foods and breezes and sunlight and so forth just didn't just didn't move me. And at that moment, there was this voice in my head that said, you know, you're grieving. Uh, grief has its wonders, but it's also it takes away where you find awe. And I went and rediscovered it. Um, and and really, this is what I've been encouraging people coming out of COVID. Um, I got outside, you know, every day. We've now done a study of what we call the awe walk with Virginia Sturm. People who are 75 years old or older. If you just go out once a week and look for awe on your regular walk, no matter where you are, uh, it shows reductions in depression and anxiety. And, and I found that to be true for me. Um, it, you know, I sought out people who inspired me morally. My brother was a, kind of a moral compass in my life. He was gone, his voice was gone, his wisdom was gone. And I found it in unusual people. The most powerful source of awe worldwide is courage, kindness, overcoming obstacles of people. Uh, and for me, it was volunteering in prison and just hearing the life stories, the way they're trying in restorative justice, trying to overcome lives of uh, violence just astounded me. Uh, you can turn to the arts. You know, culture has bequeathed us. 100,000 years of artistic things like music and art and spiritual practice and the like. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I don't like, I, I, I don't understand classical music most often. I like it a lot. And I immerse myself in, you know, classical music and had some awe experiences that, um, that got me insight into my brother's passing. And then I really, you know, to Lisa's comment, you know, our work aligns with Lisa's findings that spirit, our sense of spirit is everywhere. You know, some people find it surfing, some people find it looking at clouds, some people find it in a certain kind of music, other people find it in contemplative practice. And, you know, just thinking of, and this was William James's point that of you know, pluralism, that we have this capacity to find spirit, what we think of as divine or, or transcendent, what I would call awe, um, almost anywhere. And to just think about that if you're meditating or if you're going to temple, um, just to sense the feeling that is possible. Um, for me, it happened in a couple of places doing yoga and 
backpacking where it's like, wow, there's something bigger here um, that holds my brother, uh, holds our lives, um, that allows us to go forward after the traumas uh, that are part of living. And so, so you know, I think coming out of COVID, um, our conversation around spirituality should also, it should be a, a complimentary conversation about awe and wonder. And I am going to hand it over, or at least I'm not sure you are, to, Thank I you, think, the, the pioneer in the teaching of happiness, Tal Ben-Shahar. I remember I was thinking about teaching happiness at Berkeley, and they're like, oh, there's this class at Harvard. It's the biggest class ever, and it's revolutionizing how university education. And that is our next voice today, which is Tal Ben-Shahar. <laughs> Thank you, Dakar. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you for uh, inviting me. It's really great to be here. You know, we're going through a collective trauma right now. And uh, we see levels of uh, depression skyrocketing, anxiety skyrocketing. And the question is, what is the place of the science of happiness uh, in these times? And one of my friends recently um, said to me, shouldn't we quarantine happiness? Uh, at least for a while. And my answer to that is, is no. The thing though is that we need to understand what are the areas, what are the places, what are the interventions um, within the science of happiness that can really, really help us. And of course, you know, we heard, we talked about spirituality, uh, about awe. These are all things that can contribute. I want to talk about something which uh, to many people seems um, paradoxical when it comes to happiness. And that is that the first step to bring about happiness is allowing in unhappiness. You know, for um, um, years I've been writing about, thinking about researching the notion of the permission to be human. And uh, what, uh, what the research shows very clearly is that uh, the best way to deal with painful emotions is to uh, invite them in. You know, there's, uh, there's a wonderful poem by uh, Rumi uh, 800 years ago uh, called The Guest House. And in it, he writes about the importance of just inviting in any thought, any emotion, as if they were sent from uh, the beyond. Well, I don't know if they were or were not sent from the beyond, but I do know that doing so, allowing any and all emotions in, actually helps us to better deal with them that there is a paradox. And the paradox is that when we reject uh, sadness or anxiety or anger or hatred or envy or frustration, when we reject these emotions, these emotions only intensify. And paradoxically, when we embrace, when we accept these emotions, just allow them to flow through us naturally. That, that is when they do not overstay their welcome. Um, so I've been talking about this for a, a very long time, but it only really came home to me how difficult it is to truly accept and embrace painful emotions. Um, a few years ago, when I was uh, teaching in, in, in one of my programs, and this was a year-long program, and the students have been with me for 11 months by that time, and we met in uh, one of my favorite places in the world, Kripalu in the, in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And, you know, we were there and there were, uh, you know, 200 uh, students, there were around 20 teaching assistants, and we were all in this uh, main hall. And time came for some conversation Q&A. And a, uh, a young, young woman put her hand up. She was sitting in the second row. And, um, and I pointed to her and she started to, to talk. And immediately I could see she was overwhelmed uh, emotionally. And uh, she said, uh, I'm a psychotherapist. I have a PhD in, uh, in psychology. I've been studying with you and other uh, positive psychologists for, uh, for a few years. Um, and I feel that I'm, and I'm considered by others to be a, an expert in the field. And yet sometimes uh, I feel like I'm a fraud. And she looked down for a few seconds. And when she looked up, I could see she, she had tears in her eyes. And she says, you know, I sit in front of my clients in, uh, in, in, in the clinic 
And I help them become happier. I talk to them, they speak to me, they trust me. And yet, how can I do that? Because sometimes I go into these dark places. And what she meant by these dark places is that she experiences uh, deep sadness, sometimes depression. Um, and she said, how can I be their role model? How can I teach them? How can I help them when I go into these dark places? And she was, by this time, she was bawling. Um, so I waited a little bit and then, I, and, and then I asked her and I said to her, do you mind if I ask a question to the rest of the group? She says, sure. And I, I said to him, I said, please put your hand up if over the last three months you have been to one of those dark places. And then I addressed her again and I said, uh, just look behind you because she was sitting in front and she looks back and, and, and she smiles because of course, everyone, you know, 220 or so people had their hand up. And, um, and I said to her, we all go into these dark places. It's part of the human condition. You know, Buddha talked about it and, uh, and um, Daniel Wagner and uh, Viktor Frankl and, and so many others talk about it. You know, we, we, we all go into these dark places. And I said, I have my hand up too. I'll go into these dark places. And then I look at her and I notice something in her eyes. And I say to her, you don't believe me, do you? You don't believe me that, that I go into these dark places. And she said, no, I don't. Now, this is a young woman who's been my student for the past year. She has read my books where I talk about the importance of giving ourselves the permission to be human. I talk about us being guest houses, allowing in any and all emotions that we all experience it, that it's inevitable. And yet deep down, what she really believes is, yeah, I experience it now, but when I become a real expert in happiness, in positive psychology, then I'll be exempt from these emotions. And it just dawned on me how important it is for us as teachers, for us as parents, to communicate as partners, to communicate to others that we too go into these dark places and we don't need a pandemic to experience those hardships and difficulties and challenges. There are plenty of them to go around in normal times, whatever that means. And the key here, if we are to grow from that trauma, if we are to increase the likelihood not guarantee, but increase the likelihood of post-traumatic growth. We need to first allow in unhappiness, sadness, anxiety, frustration, confusion, whatever it is that we are feeling. And that is the first and very important step in the process of healing. Thank you, Tal, that was very moving. So let's put our heads together and see if together um, we can shed light on some of the troubles that people are facing. If we were to reverse and go back in time to before the pandemic, before COVID ever hit, and think about perhaps some of the struggles that were so embedded in our culture that they were almost invisible. They were in the air and water of our daily life. COVID has done a 52 card pickup. We have indeed, as you say, Tal, been called inward through despair, through reflection. In difficult times, we pause and consider. Yeah. What, if we think about where we were before, could be different on this side of COVID? How might this time of regrouping of hitting pause, of the forced retreat, of the journey into the center of the labyrinth, right here now in the center, provide a deep learning so that as we walk out of the labyrinth, we start to envision a new way of being. Any thoughts there? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start, you know, when I, teach happiness at Berkeley and, you know, in different contexts, you know, we, 
uh, Tal's um, uh, reflection taps into, I think, one of the fundamental problems is that we are in an era of anxiety uh, and rejection of the difficulties of living. Um, our young people are way too anxious. And, and if you can just embrace the common humanity of struggle, which COVID has brought to light uh, in some ways, uh, you know, there's always been polarized conflict about it as well. Um, that's, that's something that I think young people really and our next generation need to embrace. And then I think we need to be thinking about, you know, you, you just hear about uh, how the long-term care facilities have been devastated. And that's really a problem of loneliness uh, and disconnect. And so coming back out of the labyrinth, you know, we knew loneliness was an epidemic and people are talking about how incredible it is to have conversations, you know, um, and to make eye contact. And so how do we how do we return to that? How do we slow things down a bit and and be with other people a bit more? So I'd, I'm I'm really struck by both of your uh, reflections on that possibility and hope hope we find a way. Yeah, ju just to build on that, I think the most important thing to focus on is relationships. I mean, we know that the number one predictor of happiness uh, on an individual level is uh, quality time we spend with people we care about and who care about us. Number one predictor of national level ha of happiness is uh, you know, a supportive uh, social network. And um, you know, sometimes things need to get worse before they get better. Uh, well, things were not mm. good before the pandemic. And in a way, you know, suddenly came the pandemic and, and you know, social distancing, and um, we really can't, even if we want to, we can't see others. And what, what my hope is, um, is that people will uh, stop taking for granted the fact that um, they can uh, go out with friends and, 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 and hang out with, with family and, uh, and, and spend time with, uh, with the loved ones or with strangers. No yeah. longer take it for granted as it was taken for granted to a great extent only yeah. uh, 18 months you know, and ago. Tell, you know, I think that's so true. And I might even expand that to say, and treat people at work and at school as yeah. fellow souls on yeah. earth. Yeah. You know, for so long, I think our institutions have endorsed treating one another transactionally. You know, mm -hmm. how did I do in school versus the guy next to me? How much yeah. is that guy making compared to me? What can he do for me? I go to a dinner party and I can literally feel people measuring me. You know, <laughs> where do you live? What block are you on? Where do you go? Purely transactional. But can we start to look at each other with an open heart yeah. and even show up in such a way as to be transformational? I want to know you. I want to support you. I want to help you realize your dreams, right? And that can be a student, that can be a coworker, that can be a boss. Just because we are in a transactional space doesn't mean we need to treat one another transactionally. And in fact, I think before COVID, mass society was on the edge of sociopathy, using people as means. This oh. is our chance with an open heart to treat each other with love, with interest as souls on earth. Lisa, I want to ask you a question. Um, putting together these insights, you know, as Tal said, I mean, the science of happiness is clear, uh, social connection, relationality is, is the first step. I love Laura Karstensen's work because she finds, you know, when you're 60, 65, 70, you get happier because you realize that, right? That you're like, you know, the success and this transactional stuff, that's, you know, it has its place, but that's not the real truth here. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, with your reference to awareness and awakening and, and a transcendent insight, how do we get our hyper individualistic culture to awaken to that idea? Um, what do you think? So doctor, one of the most beautiful findings in science that I've seen is that when we look at the awakened brain, the transcendent seat of awareness with which we are all endowed, which augments our perceptual field, we might ask the question, how do we build that muscle? Is it through prayer and meditation, right? Is it through walks in nature? And all of that indeed does strengthen awakened awareness. But when we looked over thousands of people, the single path to augmented spiritual awareness is love of neighbor. Mm -hmm. If I feel really stuck and really depressed oh. and really angry and isolated, if I just put my feet first, 
and do something kind for someone. It could be my neighbor. It could be the spouse I've been living with for 20 years. Love of neighbor jump starts the ability to see, if you will, God or the transcendent or the force of life in and through one another. And then we are more able to directly connect to God or transcendence or the force of force of life directly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna, but I'm gonna relay it to Tal because Tal said something really surprising, and I know he tracks the happiness literature as well as anybody, where he was talking about you know deepening social connections and the mind that goes to family and my deep friends, and you also said strangers and acquaintances. So tell us about that. I'm curious because it feels like a, a a thing to build on here. Yeah, you know, so um, as I was saying that I was thinking about the work of uh, Barbara Fredrickson in uh, Love 2.0, which, uh, you know, many people read. And essentially what she talks about is that um, love is about, quote, positivity resonance, that the experience of love is when we connect to another person. And it could be, um, you know, to our um, nearest and dearest, but it could also end. It could also be to a person on the street. You know, we, we see a, you know, a, a little puppy and it's cute and we look at each other and we smile at each other. That's positivity resonance. Nice. And that physiologically is not as intense, but it is the same ilk as the experience of love that we feel towards our nearest and dearest. Now, what she's doing there, you know, could be perceived as, okay, so you're lowering the bar on, on love. And yes, right. that is partially true. And that's not a bad thing <laughs> because no one says we can't experience love or all a few times a week or even yeah. a day because each time we experience it, it has ramifications. It has physiological consequences. And what it also does, it's, it's connecting us to our highest self, our generous self, our kind self. So the more love we can experience, the more love we generate. And it becomes, of course, an, an, um, a self-reinforcing upward uh, spiral. So Larry, can, I, should... can I throw a pitch? I want to ask you about something. Yeah. This is, okay, love and awe, okay? Is it possible um, that when we move out of a state of narrow, what I call achieving awareness, strategy thinking, tactical mm -hmm. thinking, moving ahead and look in a more unitive way that we are, yes, we are a point and we are a wave. We are unique and magnificently diverse and we are one family of life. And when we see into the unitive reality, we're not just projecting that, but we're waking up to the fact that there is in truth, ontologically tap, you know, here and now on some level, one world. So that love is a case Awe is a magnificent expression of the awareness that we are part of one fabric of life. Can I throw that out for you to chew on? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you um, when people feel awe, and we've studied it in 30 different countries, um, they'll say things like the core to it was I, I'm, they feel a lot of this love that the special kind of love that Tal was talking about, and they feel like I'm part of something larger that I that I wasn't aware of in my ordinary waking consciousness. Sometimes it's ecosystems and people will feel like uh, trees are aware and I sense their consciousness. Sometimes it's a collective, you're walking through a busy New York street and it's like, God, we're all kind of moving to this pattern. Sometimes it's light, you know? And I think that's the key is it. And there are interesting speculations now about that may be one of the great cognitive achievements in the evolution of the human mind is to see systems in the world right. that we're part of, right? And that's so then is, if, if, is love indeed, is all indeed a perception of something true and real, there is the level on which it is a unit of reality. And when we see that, it is profoundly moving. Yeah, and, and you know, when um, we can experience that or we can reach that state through uh, the ABCs of psychology. So the A would stand for affect, which is emotion. The B would be behavior. Uh, the C uh, would be cognition. Um, so if we talk about the A, getting there through emotion, let's experience love, let's experience awe, and we expand as a yeah. result. So that's the effective path to, that, to systems. Uh, to understanding that we are one. The B behavior is through acts of kindness. That's what you talked about, Lisa, generosity, helping others, reaching out to thy neighbor. 
So that's through behavior. And then we, of course, have cognition. You know that the first class that I teach in a year long certificate program on happiness is on systems thinking. Mm. Wow. Um, so it's, it's cognitive. Yeah. And yet it's a way. It's one of three ways. Well, I'm sure there are more, but one of three ways <laughs> that, that, that I can think of to enter the realm of wholeness with the W. So this has been a beautiful conversation. We just have a few minutes. If you were to leave our friends with, we're going to go around twice, okay? Your favorite note of science is lap one, and lap two is going to be something they might investigate, something they might explore to expand their lives. Let's, should we do the science lap first? Who wants to go first? And your question is the favorite finding or note of your science? Your favorite finding from science, a little present. Oh, uh, for, for me, um, it's that the brain has been wired to find delights in what we've been talking about, you know, dopamine release, oxytocin release, vagal tone activate, vagus nerve activation, all happen as a result of kindness. So something's happened that's rewired our nervous system to, to find delight in what we've been talking about. And I, that always excites me to learn that. Um, well, th th there are so many things, but uh, one thing that, um, that comes to mind now is the importance of listening. You know mm. that the number one predictor of extraordinary leadership and leadership, it could be a Fortune 500 uh, CEO, it could be a parent at home, a teacher in the classroom. Number one predictor of lead, extraordinary leadership, which means the leadership we need today in extraordinary times is the ability to listen, not to be charismatic, not arousing speeches, not brilliance or strategic thinking, it's listening. Wow. Okay, and I guess I'll take a shot at this, which is <laughs> that um, when we looked in the scanner, whether or not someone was Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Catholic, spiritual, but not religious, they all showed the same neural correlates of spiritual awareness, what I call awakened awareness. There's one spiritual brain and we all have it, hmm. which certainly makes religious war look outdated and which certainly looks the, the anxiety around don't say a word about spirituality in the public square with disintegrating of who we really are as human beings. Spirituality is our birthright. It is essential to our whole personhood. And when we strengthen that muscle, we're healthier, life is more abundant. Life is far more full of promise and shining. Okay, mm. now one lap more, final lap, a gift this time of a practice or an insight, an invitation. Well, I'll, I'll make a pitch for the awe walk. Um, you know, we have been doing these pilgrimages and fasting walks and uh, for millennia, and we tested it in the lab. You know, these elderly people were in cities, they're in you know sub suburbs, they're in country areas. Just go find some awe once a week. And I, and I love uh, the the philosopher um, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, who was kind of a grouch, and he would do it out in the cities. And he said it brought me into the chance encounters of what's significant in the in what I take to be insignificant normally you know just seeing strangers and patterns of kids going to school and blossoms on trees suddenly he's like wow the world is wondrous so go out and do an awe walk and and find something to wonder about and when you're back from the awe walk <laughs> go for a kindness walk um, so th this is um, my, my mom's uh, exercise. So we talked about uh, uh, kindness and, and generosity and giving. And she suggested taking 15 minutes, 15 minutes for intensive kindness. Mm. Just go out, you're in the supermarket, you know, go out of your to say hello, to talk to people, to help people, to, you know, um, to, 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 to give up your, um, your place in line or whatever it is for 15 minutes. And if you can do it uh, once a week or once a day, uh, imagine the kind of impact that you will have. Because what we also know about kindness is that it's contagious. That's the kind of pandemic that we need. 
beautiful, beautiful. And I guess then I would share next time you are absolutely miserable and you don't have what you want and A plus B plus C was well-prepared and strategized and you still didn't get what you want. I invite you to consider the question, what is life showing me now? And what does my deep inner wisdom, my deep knowing say about that? And that is a form of receptive perception that expands the field of possibility and is far more shining and full of promise than what we thought we wanted very often. What we thought we wanted was retroactive. It was based on everything over my shoulder in the past. What is life showing me now has a promise beyond what I could have possibly envisioned. It's a magnificent surprise. I want to thank you both. This was wonderful. And I'm so grateful your bios will be available as links so people can find you. I want to share with our family of listeners how grateful we are to be part of the community. Thank you.